Welcome and good morning. My name is Professor John Jurians. I'm the director of the Whitlam Institute. I want to thank all of you for your attendance today and for your future engagement. I would like to also acknowledge the Whitlam board members who are here, both current as also former members of parliament who are here, and of course of the judiciary. Whitlam era associates, welcome, as well as members of the Whitlam family, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Prior to calling upon Uncle Alan Murray uh, and the Honorable John Faulkner to formally commence today's uh, provocative program entitled Breaking Ground, Lessons in Preparing for and Winning Government, the first in a series of Whitlam Institute symposia. Now, it is my great pleasure to invite Uncle Alan Murray to the fore, the chair of the Metropolitan Aboriginal Land Council, to offer the welcome to country. Uncle Alan. Thank you. My name is Alan Murray. I want to uh, greet you to do the welcome to country, but also I want to acknowledge our creator. So how are you guys? How are you? Very good. Very good. Normally our creator be army, you know, uh, given that it's been raining and a bit of a sense that it normally cries for us because a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait people have been dying of late. But also he's also weeping in, in, in the sense that he's ready to, um, I suppose, what we're seeing in parts of New South Wales and Victoria, he's crying for us in flooding, but he's doing so in part of the renewal. So flooding the plains, getting ready for the next, I suppose, cycle of life. And that's what, uh, what we believe in. Uh, my name is Alan Murray. I'm the chairperson of the Metropolitan Local Land Council. I do a lot of welcome the country. I uh, started from last Saturday uh, doing the welcome the country for Labor Council, uh, for the Prime Minister, doing a lot of welcome countries uh, with philanthropic organisations and also, I suppose, doing a lot of uh, welcome the countries for you know, social needs. But also in keeping with our understanding of the anniversary too because we've... We're hitting a milestone as well. So the Aboriginal Legal Services is having their 50th anniversary and also the Aboriginal Medical Services is having their, here in Sydney, is having their 50th anniversary as well. So it really came to prominence and I'm just sort of thinking about the mole people, old followers who, who brought those legal, uh, the Aboriginal Legal Service together and also the Aboriginal Medical Service and they're still around and I, and I think it's good to know that. Most of them are uh, Wiradjurin, so I'm a descendant from my father. He's from Kamaganja Mission, and obviously you've probably seen what was happening on the Murray, particularly Kamaganja, because that's where a lot of our, my family live, and, uh, and I've been living here in Sydney all my life. I also want to acknowledge that the goodwill of the New South Wales government to make sure we've got the Aboriginal flag as part of the unity going forward to make sure, but also we've been handed... Um, I suppose one of, the, one of the jewels of the island at Mill May or Goat Island, which is just this, this, this there. But also, I want to acknowledge across the far, I want to acknowledge the Gamaraga people, the Wangal people, the Barramatta people, but here, more importantly, 35 floors up down to, down to the foundations is the Gadigal people. This is their land, and I'll pay respects to them. As you know, if you want to walk with us, we'll walk with you. You know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander have been in this country for more than 40,000 years, 60,000 years. We've seen a great leader lead us, but also he led us and made changes and he also gave us that first land grant when I was a boy and that was in, in you know, Vincent Langari's country and all that and making sure that little offering to say, this is now your land, that little grab of sand to say, this is your land. So it's the same principles here. And that journey has been one of magnificent for, for our people in this country. We certainly would have liked to have a national land rights, but we'll certainly will get that through the changes and through the changes of the Commonwealth Government, through the Constitution, that is the Illawarra Statement from the Heart. With that, have a great morning. I pay respects to the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. They continue to live, they're part of this land. They continue to have a say. And on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Land Council and its members, welcome to 
Uh, this land, Gadda Glen, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. If I ask you this question, <laughs> always was, always will be Aboriginal Have a great morning. <laughs>Well, thank you so much, uh, Uncle Alan. And uh, on behalf of us all uh, attending this uh, symposium, let me also acknowledge the uh, traditional owners and custodians of this land. And again, on behalf uh, of everyone here, pay our respects to Elders past and present. Thank you, Uncle Alan. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name's uh, John Faulkner. I chair the Whitlam Institute. We sincerely appreciate you all uh, joining us today. As is always uh, my practice, I just particularly want to acknowledge the presence today of three former leaders of the Labor Party, uh, Jeff Gallup, who served as leader of the party in Western Australia for 15 years and Premier of that state for five years. Jeff has been a great supporter of the Whitlam Institute. Simon Crean, a former federal leader of the party and also very good friend of the Institute. Simon's father, of course, was a senior minister and later deputy prime minister uh, in the Whitlam government. And uh, Barry Unsworth, who led the party here in New South Wales and of course served as our premier. We owe Barry a huge debt of gratitude for his work to ensure that the Whitlam family home in Cabramatta will be preserved and entrusted to the Whitlam Institute to, for us to protect as an asset of the nation in perpetuity. And this is a wonderful legacy of Barry and Pauline Unsworth. Well, friends, uh, this symposium is about what made the election of another Labor leader possible 50 years ago. And to assist us in this endeavour, we commissioned scene-setting papers from two of our Whitlam Institute Distinguished Fellows, uh, Emeritus Professor Jenny Hocking and uh, Professor Frank Bongiorno, and they've done us proud. Frank, with Emma Cupid, captures a slice of the 60s. And as I've said to Frank, reading this paper really was like a walk down memory lane, a wonderful insight into the Australia before Whitlam. It helps us understand how responsive to the times uh, Whitlam's agenda was and why that agenda became so inspiring for so many. And Jenny writes of the challenges Gough faced and met to make victory possible in 1972, and of how uh, policy commitments often developed over uh, many years were central to that win. Her paper reminds us that Gough never lost sight of the importance of electoral success. Gough knew change and reform was only possible after winning office. Uh, this is our first 50th uh, anniversary event. There'll be many more. There will be other symposia on other topics, uh, including a series of symposia focusing on uh, the legal reforms undertaken by the Whitlam government. 
Sincere thanks, as always, goes to Gilbert and Tobin, Danny Gilbert uh, in particular, for their uh, wonderful support of this event and their ongoing tremendous support uh, of the work of the Whitlam Institute. Uh, friends, I'm going to conclude my remarks by doing something that I can assure you I don't ordinarily do, which is actually to quote myself. <laughs> and uh, it's not that funny, Frank. <laughs> The, the, the reason for this is that today, the 21st of October 2022, is also the anniversary of Goth's death in 2014, eight years ago. And I began my contribution at Goff's state memorial service at the Sydney Town Hall by quoting Goff. I quoted him, dying will happen sometime. As you know, I plan for the ages, not just for this life. I then said, as those words show, Gough Whitlam always thought and planned on a grand scale. And that was eight years ago, friends. Today, I can say to you with absolute certainty on the eighth anniversary of his death that Gough would be absolutely delighted such a symposium was being held. And of course, we're going to spend many hours talking about him and his legacy. <laughs> now friends, to chair our first session, I want to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Meredith Bergman, who of course is a former lecturer in politics uh, at Macquarie University. And as you all know, a former member, uh, and President of the Legislative Council in New South Wales. Please welcome Meredith. Thank you, John. Well, and welcome everyone. This session marks the launch of the first of two commission papers that you have in your packs, these beautifully presented uh, pieces. And they'll be publicly released on the Institute's website later today. And um, biographies of professors Frank Bongiorno and Michelle Arrow are included in your program. So I won't embarrass them by reading out all their wonderful deeds. They're both historians of significant standing and are a formidable double act as they are the president and vice president of the Australian Historical Association. And I might just add that if you follow them both on Twitter, you would have seen the amazing advocacy work that they have been undertaking in support of our national archives and other cultural institutions, which of course we're very hopeful now with the change of circumstances this year that might start getting some of the funding that they so desperately need. And Frank, I'm delighted that we are launching your paper Australia Before Whitlam, A Slice of the 60s. And we're doing that today and then hearing Professor Arrow's response to it uh, before we turn to questions from the audience. And we are leaving plenty of time for questions from the audience. But the first comment I want to make about uh, Frank's wonderful paper is, that's not history, that's just the story of my life. <laughs> anyway, Frank Bongiorno. Um, look, thanks um, very much for that, Meredith. And it's interesting that Meredith actually appears in both the essays, I notice, which is, is wonderful. Um, so both, both the social history and the political history and everything in between. Um, so it was uh, an absolute delight to work on, on that. Um, so in, in the essay I, I co-wrote with Emma Cupid, who's here, um, for this occasion, we point out that when uh, Gough Whitlam became federal leader of the Australian Labor Party in February 1967, Australia's Indigenous people were still some way from being treated as equals by Australia's white majority. Indeed, in the 1960s, the already marginalised were sometimes being dispossessed anew. At Weeper in northern Queensland, vast lands were taken by a foreign company, Camelco, to mine bauxite 
for aluminium. Uh, people were thrown out of their beachfront homes and placed in what were known locally as sardine cans. Um, they lacked stoves, plumbing or toilets. Um, the white people who came to work in the mines had pleasant modern housing built for them. Now, when the memorial service um, was held for Gough Whitlam in 2014 in the, the Sydney Town Hall, the Indigenous lawyer and, and leader, um, Noel Pearson, would say, without this old man, the land and human rights of our people would never have seen light of day. When Whitlam became leader in 1967, Pearson was not yet two years old and was living on the Hope Vale Lutheran Mission. Um, under new legislation passed in 1965 that awarded bureaucrats massive control over the lives of those um, who were called assisted Aborigines and Islanders. Their property could be seized and sold. Um, they could be moved around at the will of the authorities and those same authorities could declare someone not living on a reserve assisted and thereby take control of their lives. For Pearson, I quote, the world outside my home was a daunting place, promising episodes of shame and humiliation. That's a man who's just a, a little bit older than me. It was in the mid-1960s that a, a gardener at, um, let's see if we can get that for me, a gardener at the University College of Townsville, Kwaki Eddie Marbo, was learning from the historian Henry Reynolds that the lands of his island in the Torres Strait were actually crown land, not, not his own, not his own property as he thought. He would spend his lunch times in the university library reading about the efforts of British anthropologists back in the 1890s to understand, or as he often felt, misunderstand his people. Other Indigenous activists were also beginning to make their mark. Udru Nunukal, uh, then known as Kath Walker, um, was a successful poet and activist who in 1969 would run as a Labor candidate in the state election in Queensland. A young uh, Gumangeri man, Gary Foley, had just arrived in, in Sydney in 1967 as an apprentice draftsman. He'd been expelled from his country high school the previous year and, of course, would become one of the influential younger activists of that era as well as a, a, an actor. So what, what I've said so far will give you a flavour of the essay that we've, we've written, and it adopts what's been called a slice approach to history. The best known exam, um, instance of the slice approach was in the bicentennial history, as they were called Australians, a historical library published, well, whenever that is, 1987, a long time ago, and they took a particular year. I think it was 1838 and 1888 and then... Uh, 19, sorry, 1888, 1938, and they, they basically sketch what the society was like at that particular moment as a way of trying to really dig down and almost excavate that society. And that's what we've tried to do here. We've been even narrower. We didn't even really do 1967. We homed in on February 1967. <laughs> but we do look forward and back quite a bit. Um, so the brief was to evoke Australia before Whitlam. John Faulkner rang me up and thought, geez, that sounds a bit daunting. How are we going to do that? Anyway, we decided at an early stage that one way to do it would be to set out what Australia looked like when uh, Whitlam became leader of the Federal Labor Party on the 8th of February 1967. Now, it just so happened that five days before occurred one of the most momentous events in Australian history the execution of Ronald Ryan, the last judicial hanging in the nation's history. Now, that ex execution occurred in the midst of protest in which Labor Party and trade union figures were very prominent. The future Labor Minister, Barry Jones, already famous, of course, as a quiz champion, there he is, over on the right, um, was effective leader of the campaign against capital punishment in Victoria. Now, you might ask what this might has to do with, with Gough Whitlam. Well, in, in some ways, perhaps not much. Um, Whitlam spoke against capital punishment on several occasions in the federal parliament, calling it barbaric, and his government would abolish capital punishment for federal offences in 1973, as, as Jenny Hockey um, has, uh, Hocking, I should say, has written about in her biography. Um, but the point of including capital punishment in this essay, right at the beginning, right up front, is a wider one. It was emblematic of the new progressivism of the 1960s, the wind of change, as Harold Macmillan had called it in South Africa at the beginning of the decade. 
emerging alongside issues such as opposition to the white Australia policy, to racially discriminatory uh, immigration, uh, opposition to apartheid in, in South Africa, and rather more slowly than was warranted by the nature of the problem, the poor treatment of Indigenous people in Australia. Um, you can point, there are a whole bunch of other issues too, consumer rights, a whole range of them which emerged in the early 1960s. Now, as we point out in the essay, Vietnam too, the Vietnam War was by 1967 also in the process of becoming the defining issue of, of a new wave of radicalism, perhaps a little bit different to the, the early 60s stuff um, that emerges in the late 60s. Uh, Air Vice Marshal Key's controversial visit to Australia, you know, one of the leaders of, of South Vietnam, occurred in the process of transition from Arthur Corwell to Gough Whitlam. It was between the 1966 election and, and Whitlam becoming leader. Corwell called Key a fascist, a murderer, a miserable little butcher, and a gangster Keesling. This is our great ally. Um, some thought he was trying to embarrass Whitlam, actually, with his, his media rhetoric, um, for whom, and for Whitlam, for the new leader, Vietnam loomed as a treacherously difficult issue in the wake of the so-called Vietnam election of 1966, a monumental defeat for Labor under Corwell. Uh, Rodney Cavalier pointed out to me, um, very kindly read a draft of this essay, that it was a much bigger victory than anything Menzies had managed to achieve. Of course, Holt was leader by this time. Now, as Whitman would later tell um, the Victorian Labor Party's state conference in 1967, every trap and inducement had been laid for him when he'd become leader to say when he was getting out of Vietnam and when he was going into Victoria, uh, that is, to the Victorian branch of the Labor Party that Jenny talks about in her essay uh, in much more detail than we do here. Um, so, yes, the latter reference was to the, that, that state's left-dominated and anti-Whitlam executive. And, and Goff would famously tell them at the same conference, of course, um, a long-remembered quote, only the impotent were pure. Um, the new leadership, um, Lance uh, Barnard there alongside Goff Whitlam, Lionel Murphy and Sam Cohen, looked young and fresh in a country that had grown accustomed to being governed by old or at least older men. They were all 45 to 50. Keep in mind that Harold Holt's in his late 50s by the time he is 57 when he becomes leader. Goff was the oldest. Um, it was noticed in the commentary that all were university educated, something frankly new, I think, for Labor. I mean, there had been figures like Evett, but certainly to have four leaders like that university educated was new. Three were QCs, none were Catholics. In a still rather white, Anglo and um, Celtic looking Australia, relentlessly so in the nation's parliaments, of course, Sam Cohen, being the Jewish son of European migrants, attracted no particular notice in the press coverage that I saw. Nor did there seem to be any particular interest in the leader and deputy leader being returned servicemen. Some of you might remember Goff's famous quip, God, it must have got up, gotten up the noses of the RSL that the Duumvirate in 1972 was Australia's first all ex-services government. Um, so, but that, that didn't attract any particular notice. Uh, um, of course, returned men and, and women to some extent um, were prominent in public affairs. And, could be, and that could be taken for granted then at a time when men like Gough uh, Whitlam and John Gorton marched unfussily alongside former comrades on Anzac Day rather than making grand speeches about wars only known secondhand, um, which is what we've had obviously in more recent decades. Um, there were, of course, no women. Um, indeed, there was only one woman in caucus in 1967 and there would soon be none after Dorothy Tangney left politics the following year. Um, Elizabeth Freed would remember this well, none, in 19, 1972 uh, when uh, the, the Labor Party was elected. Um, now, uh, that made Margaret in, in many ways all the more important. She'd become a very important figure in um, Whitlam and Labor's bid for election, as Jenny Hocking shows um, in, in this essay, I think, um, probably at, at that level of detail for the first time, very interestingly. Um, it was market research. They knew that, that Margaret was a great asset. Um, and she celebrated her husband's victory in the leadership election with a piece of steak, some potato and vino, the last, perhaps the only real concession to the more cosmopolitan vision of Australia that the Whitlams would champion and help to realise. So we present the Australia of February 1967 as a kind of in-between place. Um, there was plenty that would have looked familiar 
from Whitlam's own youth in the 1920s and 1930s. The country still rode on the sheep's back, even as it became more industrial, and the mining boom took off. Keep in mind just how recent that was. Australia had an embargo on the export of iron ore until 1960, because they didn't know they had much of it. It was considered a strategic and potentially scarce commodity. Um, so the mining boom is, is, is a, a very recent vintage. Australia was also sending wheat to China. The patterns of its trade were shifting decisively from Britain to Asia. Indeed, 1967 was the very year that Japan became Australia's leading uh, export market. Britain, of course, applied to join the European Economic Community for the second time in 1967 and was again rebuffed as it had been previously the following year. Harold Wilson would announce uh, the withdrawal of uh, all forces, or most forces, east of the Suez Canal by the early 1970s. So it's a period in which Australia is starting to, to, to look post-imperial in a whole range of ways. That has more to do with what Britain's doing in a lot of ways than, than what Australia was doing. The Australian government had its hand in the economy in ways that can seem absolutely bizarre today. But this was the system of protection all round that had sort of evolved in the 1920s. Um, a system of bargains that ensured most sec sectors of the economy received some degree of support from government, although some more than others. So dairy producers reckon they deserved protection from the depredations of margarine manufacturers. Uh, many of you will remember those ads in the 1960s and 70s that made margarine seem as glamorous as diamonds. Um, <laughs> workers were highly unionised. Uh, the majority, of course, belonged to unions. Wages and conditions were fixed via the Arbitration Commission or sometimes state tribunals. But there seemed to be a trend towards employers and workers making their own agreements in an economy that was growing very rapidly and delivering great affluence to most Australians. Car, uh, well, both home and car ownership had climbed dramatically since the war. Women were entering the workforce in ever larger numbers, although not on equal terms to men. And of course, this was another matter to which the Whitlam government would turn its attention a few years later among its first actions. More young people were completing more years at school, but fewer than one in five Australians, um, 19 or above, um, had gone beyond year 10 still in 1967. The entire enrolment of Australia's universities um, was not much greater than the enrolment at Monash University today, which I think is the largest of them. Um, so again, that gives you an indication of, of how exclusive, really, a university education still was at that time. Men were more likely to attend than women, but colleges of ed education were also growing rapidly, <laughs> not least because governments found them cheaper to run. All of this seemed to speak of a progressive, affluent nation taking its place in the modern world, but it had a downside, as well as its critics. One of the most famous of them internationally was the American economist, J.K. Galbraith, who in a famous book, 1958, The Affluent Society, had spoken of private affluence and public squalor. It was an image that appealed to a rising Australian politician named Gough Whitlam. Um, then, of course, in Parliament for just half a decade um, in the, the late uh, 1950s. And he'd soon be talking about the task of government being to manage abundance, not ration scarcity. As a suburbanite himself, Whitlam understood how sparse public provision was in those sprawling cities with their emerging shopping malls or shopping centres, uh, lacking sewerage and other amenities. Um, work by economists in Melbourne found poverty amidst Australian plenty. And I know uh, Emily Mullane will be talking a bit more about this later. The elderly, the sick, um, women, disabled, um, Aboriginal people had not shared in that affluence, or at least not to the full extent. Many were outside the social security system. Country towns could be places of economic and social contrast, local graziers at the top of the ladder, but poverty sometimes in towns and villages. Women suffered discrimination in many aspects of their lives, um, and Australian society still worked hard to dampen their aspirations. And there's Merle Thornton and Rosalie Bogner's protest against their exclusion from the bar of the Regatta Hotel in Brisbane in 1965. Yet even in February 67, the women's liberation movement was, a, was still a few years off. More generally, um, some critics now thought that development was not all it was cracked up to be. 
a Melbourne lawyer and Fabian socialist with political ambitions thwarted by the local left uh, junta. Um, there he is, John Button, um, co-organised a series of autumn lectures for the Fabian Society in Melbourne in 1965 that would result in the book, Look Here, Considering the Australian Environment, with that rather striking image on the front of a broken bottle, which I take to represent the old, rough Australia. It's an image, actually, that I, I suspect comes from um, Peter Coleman's writing from the early 60s, where he talked about the, 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 sm the open smile being combined with the broken bottle. Uh, it registered, um, the book that is, registered the shift from a notion of a standard of living, a very material measure, to quality of life a widely used term that seemed rather post-material. Button satirised the warm afterglow of an economic orgasm that he saw in the often ugly post-war urban environment. Um, the ar architect Robin Boyd contributed to both the lectures and the book. Fights were brewing over the environment. Threats to the Great Barrier Reef spawned a movement to protect it. Successful then, but of course a struggle that remains with us. In the month Whitlam became leader, devastating bushfires in Tasmania took 62 lives, destroyed vast amounts of land and property, or country and property. In the island states, in Tasmania, the Hydroelectricity Commission already had well-developed plans to dam Lake Pedder, and the Whitlam government would be unable to stop that, but of course both environment, environmentalists and government would be better uh, um, armed, I guess, and uh, more prepared the next time round in the early 80s with the Franklin. Australian identity was changing in the 60s and in the wake of Britain's turn towards Europe. This was occurring quite rapidly by 1967. Whitlam would ride that wave, but of course, as we know, he never just rode waves, he made them. The Opera House was still under construction as a legacy of a state Labor government, and so was the National Library Building that would open in 1968. But most of those national cultural institutions now sitting next to Lake Burley Griffin in Canberra were still either infant, infants or yet to come. Books were appearing that would have considerable influence on how Australians saw themselves, bestsellers like Donald Horne's A Lucky Country, Geoffrey Blaney's A Tyranny of Distance, mid-60s. Two volumes of Manning Clark's History of Australia would appear in the 1960s. The new wave of Australian theatre was beginning to take off, particularly centred on Carlton in Melbourne. And the federal government was turning its attention to how an Australian film industry might be developed. They're a weird mob, of course, set in this city, and how beautiful Sydney looks in it was 1966. The wave of post-war immigration continued, but Australia was actually finding it harder to, tra to attract immigrants um, from the usual European sources um, that had served it so well since the war. Many migrants lived hard lives in Australian factories and in the suburbs. Their home governments were becoming more interested in how they were being treated in Australia, and that didn't always bear close scrutiny. In 1967, Australia signed an immigration agreement with Turkey, the first Muslim country um, that it had entered into such an agreement with. And of course, there was a, a quiet liberalisation of the white Australia policy going on, but that would not be ended until Whitlam. Australia still had its own little empire in Papua New Guinea, although probably most Australians no longer quite thought of it that way. That too would be gone as a result of the Whitlam government's initiatives in 1975. Now, I won't try your patience further. You can read the essay yourself um, and you can be reminded of sporting heroes of the past. There we go. Uh, television shows that are now obtainable only directly from Crawford's, uh, from box sets. Um, and for all I know, uh, music that you might have been bopping to last week, since much of it lives on. Um, Goff probably didn't notice that just as he was assuming the leadership of the Australian Labor Party and writing in The Australian about the need for a modern socialism, yes, he did use that term in The Australian in 1967, in February, the double A side of Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane was entering the record stores in February 1967. <laughs> Emma and I have tried to evoke the times that were certainly a change in, but which in many respects would have still been recognisable to a, a new Labor leader born in 1916. We conclude by calling him among the greatest of the nation's reforming prime ministers. And when he died in 2014, I was struck by the way that prompted public reflection on both the possibilities of Australian politics and also the narrowing of its horizon since, and I think particularly 
in this century. And I think that's one reason why these anniversaries are going to be so important. Um, they invite us to renew our commitment to changing the country. So I'd like to thank um, John Durrance, uh, John Faulkner, Kim Williams, Andrea Connor, Fiona Paisley, uh, Pacey, uh, Renaka Tandon, um, Rodney Cavalier for his comments, and everyone at the Whitlam Institute for their support of this research. It's been an enormous pleasure and honour to be involved, and I wish the Institute and the Whitlam family well in the anniversary years ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. And uh, Michelle Arrow will now respond. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, uh, Meredith. And I'd like to also begin by acknowledging that we meet today on the unceded lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and to pay my respects to the knowledge embedded within Aboriginal custodianship of country. I'm really delighted, like Frank, and honoured to be here today, and I'd like to thank the team at the Whitlam Institute for their invitation to contribute to this discussion. Ably assisted and co-authored by um, Emma Cupid, Frank argues um, in his vivid, wide-ranging portrait of 1960s Australia that the nation was in, as he said, an in-between place in 1967, the year that Gough Whitlam <coughs> assumed the leadership of the ALP. In every facet of Australian society, there were signs of change and signs of stasis, an old world that was holding on and new voices, both of rupture and renewal, that were growing in volume and confidence. And by 1972, those voices would be impossible to ignore. The hanging of Ronald Ryan, which opens the essay, is really a microcosm of those forces of change <coughs> and stasis. Ryan's execution, the first in Victoria since 1951, mobilised uh, labour activists and progressives opposed to capital punishment. And Victorian Premier Henry Bolte's stubborn insistence that the, that the execution proceed became the defining event of his long political career. As Frank notes, five days after Ryan's execution, Whitlam became federal leader of the ALP. And, of course, his government would go on to abolish the death penalty at the Commonwealth level in 1973. The campaign against capital punishment is a great place to start because it, it really emboldened a number of progressive Australians to swim against the prevailing tide of the age. They would become ever more active in the following years, campaigning for reform on censorship, conscription, immigration, abortion, homosexual law reform and Indigenous rights, among other issues. They looked at 1960s Australia with fresh eyes and they were increasingly blunt as, as to what they saw were its shortcomings. And the Labor Party under Whitlam became increasingly in tune with their views and it had plans to address them as part of a larger policy program which sought, as Frank noted, uh, as Whitlam said, not to ration scarcity but to plan abundance. So Frank and Emma's essay is characteristic, characteristically sorry, comprehensive, wry and humane. I think all of us who know Frank's work will, will know that that's the way that Frank writes. It moves easily between the national stage and the suburban street, between the increasingly fraught geopolitics of the Vietnam War to Australian women's great enthusiasm for the contraceptive pill. It is a portrait that many younger Australians will find baffling, compulsory national service, the illegality of male homosexuality and abortion, the absence of an Australian national gallery or museum, a world before Medicare. Perhaps most staggering is the place of First Nations people within the Australian nation of 1967. As Frank notes in the conclusion to the essay, when Australia designed its pavilion for Expo 67, it was decorated with Indigenous art, but Indigenous people were entirely absent. Yet elsewhere, there were more promising signs, more obviously, most obviously the widespread support for the 1967 referendum and the emergence of Indigenous activists who were growing impatient with gradual reform. One of the most fascinating details of the essay is the story of Eddie Mabo convening a conference in Townsville in 1967, which asked the question, what is to follow the referendum? In time, of course, all Australians would come to know Eddie Mabo's name but that was still decades away. So what I want to do in my short response is to drill down into some of the ways Australia changed between 1967 and 1972, with a focus on the ways that parts of the electorate changed and the ways that the ALP changed to meet them. 
I want to focus particularly on some of those constituencies that had not necessarily always been traditionally labour to that point, the middle class, women and youth, to consider the ways that those forces of change were sort of bubbling to the surface in new places. Now, while we tend to write about Labor's victory in 1972, and I kind of think we all think of it this way in some ways as if it were inevitable, it's worth remembering that this was not a universal view when Whitlam first assumed the leadership. In early 1967, Harold Holt was celebrating his first, the first anniversary of his ascension to the prime ministership. And while he was 59 years old, he nonetheless exuded fitness and modernity, as Frank notes. By the time of Holt's leadership, the Liberal Party had enjoyed more than almost two decades of dominance of Australian federal politics. And journalist Craig McGregor, in his book Profile of Australia, wrote from his vantage point of 1966 that the Liberal Party looked like modernisers, less hidebound than their Labor opponents. This is before, of course, Whitlam became leader, opposition leader. McGregor noted that the, Labor Party, the Liberal Party had made divorce easier, granted direct aid to church schools in 1963, slowly modified the white Australia policy and showed some willingness to be more liberal on censorship than the ALP. McGregor argued that Australian politics in general was, quote, an exercise in conservatism and predicted, somewhat boldly, barring a political catastrophe, it would seem that the conservative parties are set fair for a further unbroken period of years in power. There was further reason for Labor pessimism, I suppose, in the continued presence of the DLP, which remained an obstacle to regaining power, especially in Victoria. Indeed, as the political scientist Richard Reid noted, DLP preferences were mostly to blame for Labor's defeat at the 1969 election, where the party nonetheless achieved a 7% swing and fell just four seats short of victory. As Jenny Hocking notes in her essay, Whitlam's first and most urgent task was to reshape the party for a new order in order to become electable, particularly by appealing to the expanding, increasingly progressive middle class who had long voted for the Conservative parties. A 1963 survey found that 56% of white collar workers voted Liberal and only 25% voted Labor, 11% voted DLP. Whitlam's background and persona was critical in overcoming the Australian public's suspicions about Labor. He was not like a traditional Labor politician and certainly light years away from Caldwell. He carried little of the historical baggage of decades of Labor struggle, including the long Labor campaign to restrict non-white migration. Graeme Freudenberg called Caldwell the last, the greatest and the most articulate of the red blood Australian racists who formed the early AOP. Just as Donald Horne removed the infamous slogan, Australia for the white man from the masthead of the bulletin in 1961, so too Whitlam's replacement of Caldwell was a signal that Labor was moving to a different political ethos beyond its kind of traditional base of, of only, of, of relying on organized Labor for support. Whitlam, writes Frank, went out of his way to flatter and engage citizens whom he believed had the education, knowledge and expertise to help him remake the country and that included a number of members of the middle class. Whitlam recognised that Labor needed to reimagine their social democratic principles for a new era, foregrounding equality of opportunity, rights and justice. Not only was this the foundation for a more wide-ranging notion of equality for Labor, it was one that would come to embrace feminism and multiculturalism. These beliefs chimed with an affluent, more educated middle class, and they would ultimately find expression in the Whitlam government's emphasis on open government, which invited citizens to take a much more active role in their communities and in their governing. Whitlam's Labor Party was growing more in tune with middle class progressives. Influenced by humanism and civil liberties, progressives sought greater freedom of action, expression, association and privacy for Australian citizens. They were also more likely to be eager consumers of Australian culture and adherents of the new nationalism of the late 1960s. Labor had a great deal of work to do with women voters in 1967. Like their counterparts in other Western democracies, Australian women in the 1960s continued to display a distinct liberal bias in their voting habits. These days, the two party preferred uh, gender gap in voting favours Labor. In Profile of Australia, McGregor asked the New South Wales Secretary of the Labor Party what the party intended to do about the women's vote following their 1963 election defeat. And he replied, nothing. The women vote just as their husbands tell them. <laughs> 
Indeed, Murray Goot and Elizabeth Reid um, found in their groundbreaking analysis of female voters in Australia that research questionnaires at the time often only asked men based on an assumption that women would simply vote the same way as their husbands or fathers. Women were assumed to lack interest in politics. Certainly, many women had little time or inclination for politics, but that may have been because Australian politics was at that stage largely conducted on terms that excluded them by old men who typically didn't speak to them. As Frank notes, women's liberation had not quite reached Australia's shores in 1967. Though we can say, I think, with some confidence that many Australian women were suffering the problem that has no name, that the American feminist Betty Friedan identified in her groundbreaking 1963 book, The Feminine Mystique. In a cover story for the Bulletin in September 1967, journalist April Hersey asked, what should we do with the educated woman? And the cover of the, um, the magazine had a picture of a woman struggling to do kind of uni work on the table while there were a couple of children clambering all over her. Focusing on women who were studying at the then brand new Macquarie University, Hersey described a group of suburban middle-class women who felt trapped and alone. One woman told Hersey she waited for her son to take his nap, quote, like someone who looks for an oasis in a desert. But she was always too tired, she said, to enjoy these moments of respite. Sometimes she mused, I remember all the glowing comments I used to find on my essays at university. And I think this neat little house must be some kind of joke, but it's a joke I've played on myself. I love my home. I love my husband and children. But what has happened to me? Now, this was a middle-class, affluent problem. It's hard to imagine the working-class migrant women who were trying to raise families while holding down factory jobs necessarily felt the same way. But it contained the seeds of larger change, and it was, via the bulletin, attracting the attention of the mainstream media. The women in Hersey's story who were taking up tertiary study were driven and focused, determined to pursue intellectual interests alongside their roles as mothers. Women like them would go on to join the women's electoral lobby, who flexed their newfound electoral muscle during the 1972 election campaign with their survey of political candidates. The political scientist Don Aitken told the New York Times that the women's electoral lobby was the phenomenon of the 1972 elections. Thanks in part to Wells' mobilisation of a new constituency of women voters, the Whitlam government would go on to enact sweeping reforms for women including the appointment of the world's first uh, women's advisor to a national leader, the women's liberation activist Elizabeth Reid in 1973. And if you want to read more about that, we have a book coming out next year where you can <laughs> read all about that. Um, finally, by 1967, there were signs that young Australians might make a distinctive mark on Australian culture. Many of them, as Frank noted, were better educated than their parents and most embraced a hedonistic popular culture which had become a part of a lucrative consumer youth market. And youth was on the ascendant through sheer force of numbers. In 1966, the Australian population was young, thanks to the baby boom and post-war migration. 41% of Australians were aged under 21 in 1966, and the average age of Australians was 30. By 1970, it would be 27. Today, for comparison's sake, it's 38. The shift from Caldwell to Whitlam was read in part as a generational one. McGregor went so far as to call Whitlam a political mod, I think that's a great description, <laughs> sharp, up-to-date and very much part of the cool-headed generation which has grown to power since the war. As Frank notes, by contrast, Caldwell was a Labor war horse with a record of party activism stretching back to 1916, the year of Whitlam's birth. When Whitlam assumed the leadership, he was 50, younger than Bob Hawke or Anthony Albanese when they became Labor leaders. Frank reminds us that public life in the 1960s was still governed by ageing men whose values had been formed in earlier eras. The introduction of conscription in 1964 cohered to these older values. By 1966, national servicemen were being sent to fight and die in Vietnam. These young men might die for their country, but they could not yet vote to choose their government. Labor had suffered a humiliating defeat in the polls in 1966 in what was in effect a referendum on Australian involvement in the Vietnam War. 
There was still majority support for the war when Whitlam became leader, but opposition grew in the wake of the Tet Offensive in 1968 and only accelerated into the early 1970s. Frank argues that Vietnam was the issue more than any other that ended the political torpor and complacency of the Menzies era. Opposition to the war radicalised many Australians, most notably the women of Save Our Sons, and it was by no means a youth-only movement, but young people were some of its most radical and visible anti-war activists. Significantly, the anti-war movement, with its sweeping critique of American imperialism and racism, supplied activists with a vocabulary to tackle other inequalities. The 1971 Springbok Tour of Australia, in which Meredith played such an important role, is just one example of that kind of activism. And of course, the treatment of women in the anti-war movement helped to generate the women's liberation movement in the early 1970s. Whitlam recognised the new political mood amongst young people when his government lowered the voting age to 18 in 1973. Introducing the legislation, Fred, Minister Fred Daly said he believed the change would mean that, quote, our young people will be involved in the political life of the nation and will be able to direct their creative energies and enthusiasm to a better Australia. So just to wind up, the years between early 1967, when Whitlam became leader of the opposition, and December 1972, when Labor was elected to government, were a period of extraordinary change in Australia. Just before Whitlam assumed the leadership, Craig McGregor had predicted that sooner or later, politics will have to reflect the quickening of activity which has occurred in so many areas of Australian life. Whitlam's arrival and his activity in opposition signalled, I think, that that quickening had begun. Similarly, Frank and Emma's essay shows how and why Australia in 1967 was in many ways primed for a new Labor politics, one that looked forward, not back. It is a sweeping portrait of the nation that Whitlam hoped not only to lead, but to transform. And I look forward to hearing more about how he did that in today's symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle. I've recently brought out a book with Nadia Wheatley called Radicals Remembering the 60s. And we assumed when we started interviewing uh, people who had been radicalised in the 60s that Vietnam would be the issue that did that. And strangely, it wasn't. Mm. And one of the important issues was the execution of Ronald Ryan. And I suddenly realised that my first overt political activity was putting up posters saying no to hanging around the university. And um, so it, it was a hugely important issue which tends to be forgotten when people are writing about this period. So having uh, said that, can we start with some questions, please? Murray, Murray Goode. What strikes me... Um first of, uh, of the Frank and Emma paper and secondly from Michelle, is the sort of um, Whiggish view of history, if I might put it that way, um, in which we move uh, from uh, unfreedom to various kinds of freedom to progress to affluence and so on. Um, this seems, to, uh, this seems to me to be a very professional, middle-class, progressive reading of the history. Um, and it raises the question, of course, why was the victory in 72 so narrow? If you read these accounts, you would think that Whitlam would have won at least 60% of the vote. Um, it also raises the question about the importance of Labor and Whitlam in this transition from a coalition government to a Labor government. There is, after all, an argument that what happened in 1972 was a, a highly incompetent government um, was thrown out and that a somewhat more competent government could have easily hung on. I mean, it's a view put by David Butler at Oxford, amongst others. So I'm just wondering how you square... Uh, the vote and the alternative accounts of that vote with your own 
history. Frank? Uh, thanks, yeah. Uh, first go. Yes, I mean, um, Clyde Cameron, um, admittedly by the time he made this comment, no friend of Whitlam, um, thought that if, if they'd kept Gorton, that the coalition probably would have won, he believed. Um, yeah, look, I, I think that's that's fair comment. I think... Um, and, and I think the SA does... Well, it probably doesn't do it as explicitly as it might, but... Um, we, we do suggest a number of the ways in which the post Menzies coalition governments did in fact manage to respond to the very same forces, of course, that Whitlam is also responding to, sometimes in very similar ways, as a matter of fact. I mean, the new nationalism, for instance, and all of the kinds of cultural institutions to which it gave rise and the, the cultural policies to which it gave rise are, are really flourishing by the time you get to the early 1970s. Um, I mean, a lot of the institutions that either didn't exist or barely existed in 1967 were, were kind of there by 1972. Um, so a part of the answer is surely that those, those governments, for all their faults, um, and I suppose Holtz and, well, maybe even McMahon's actually. I mean, we've got uh, the world authority on the McMahon government here, Patrick Mullins uh, uh, today. Um, they, 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 my sense is they responded more effectively um, to, to a whole range of issues, even wim like women's issues. I mean, Elizabeth, I know, will have views on this. Um, uh, I hope I'm not misquoting you, Elizabeth, but pointing out that McMahon was by no means dreadful on that particular that particular issue, for instance. So um, that, I think that would be the response and perhaps does help to explain the narrowness of that of that victory in 1972. I don't know if you... Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I did... I was struck when I was reading the... Because I went back to looking at Craig McGregor's book, you know, which is written 66 comments on Whitlam, you know, and he makes that point that the, the Liberal government at that point looked like a dominant force, that um, they looked like modernisers compared to, to Labor. And so I, I wanted to try and raise that because I think we do tend to write this history as if it were, as if victory were inevitable. And I think it's important to acknowledge that that is by no means the case. I guess one thing too is 69 is important in this because there's such a big, um, you know, the swing is so big and I think that perhaps... Yes, exactly. You know, the, the, the big swing in 69 helped set up the victory in 72. But I think, you know, as you say, that there are um, issues in which, you know, the Gorton government was certainly responding better to some of these, the, this mood for change. But I think that my argument was in part the way that, you know, the women's electoral lobby and that very effective strategy, I think, was one important difference where you could see you know, the scorecards were there and that did kind of provide, I think, for a lot of, of people to make a new evaluation. And particularly, I think, McMahon, while I don't think he was, you know, as, as terrible on women's issues, he certainly didn't perform well in that survey and, and many ministers in his government. And it wasn't that it was the deciding issue of the election, but I think it was a really important part of that election to look, you know, capture that moment of you know, women of Australia were looking for something different and I think that, you know, Labor's capturing that mood and, and responding to that mood was very important. But I think you're totally right, Murray. I think that makes a really good point. The research doesn't really support um, an argument about Labor having enormous attraction. Um, the focus mm. groups don't. The qualitative work doesn't. If you look at the Gallup poll taken around the time, it's clear that McMahon was having an effect on the coalition vote and Whitlam wasn't. Mm. That, that said, Murray, I mean, it's a pretty healthy um, two-party preferred vote. I mean, it's not as big as Hawke's in 83, but it, 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 was, it was a reasonably healthy one in 72, um, more or less upheld, I might add, in 74. Um, so, I mean, it, 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 there's nothing disgraceful about it. I mean, I, I guess the issue is kind of where the votes were in terms of electorates mm. too. I mean, how they – I mean, you know more about this – how they translated into actual seats. But, you know, the two-party preferreds are pretty decent, solid, you know, um, by, by historical standards, a pretty pretty reasonable one. Yeah. I'm, I'm very glad that uh, this discussion has broken out, but <laughs> we, are trying, we are trying to actually uh, get it recorded for uh, posterity. So it might be good if you make it in a more formal way. Mm. Um, 
Rod Cavalier, next one, and then Jeff Gallup. Um, and it also helps if you speak into the microphone, people like Murray Good, so those who are short of hearing can hear you. <laughs> so thank you for those remarks, uh, Madam Chair. I congratulate uh, Professor Belgiorno on his paper and the commentary by Michelle. I had the privilege of reading Frank's paper in manuscript, if that word can apply to digital versions. I wanted to talk about the 60s and put forward, as important as 67 was in terms of Labor history, 1968 is the seminal year in that decade and put forward a view that there are three important years after 1945 in the remainder of the 20th century they being 1956, 68 and 89. 56 because of Suez and Hungary, 89 because of the fall of the Soviet Empire. But 68 seemed to have events all the way through. And in very brief, the Tet Offensive, which kills the popularity of the Vietnam War in the United States and in Australia. The riots in Paris that took the Fifth Republic to the brink. The Black Power salute at the Olympics. The, the Prague Spring, which is terminated by Soviet tanks. These are major events. And of course, in Australia, there is Gough resigns over the Haradine affair, on which he was wholly wrong. Um, and we might deal with that when Jenny Hawking's paper comes forward. I just, Frank is a master of writing about decades and slices of time. And this is a magisterial paper. And I know you, can't, you deliberately concentrated on 1967. I have no cavil with that. In terms of E.G. Whitlam and 1967, it's building the party out of the ruins of defeat in 66. Harold Holt achieved in 66 a bigger vote and a bigger majority than Menzies had in any of his victories since 49. The despair that we felt at that time was greater than anything until the Rudd era, when in government we failed. Goff had to, first of all, instill confidence. And this is where uh, Frank is dead right, building it from nowhere. The 67 conference is a holding operation. It is there that he asserted the right for the leader, the deputy leader and the parliamentary leadership to be inside the room. Because, and I'll finish on this, Madam Chair, Goff believed he could win any argument. He believed in the power of persuasion, something that was lost by Labor after 1996. He believed in any setting... Large or small, written or oral, he could win the argument. And he usually was right. <laughs> Do you want to comment on that, Frank or Michelle? Uh, no, I'm not going to take this comment. <laughs> what can I say? You know? yes. uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Jeff Gallup. Thanks very much, Meredith. For a question. Thanks, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to get to the question. But the point I wanted to make is that in preparation for this, I thought... Let's go to the people that didn't like Gough back in the 1960s and fought against him, and what did they say about him? And so I've been reading up my Arthur Corwell, <laughs> partly in due deference to my mother, who loved Arthur Corwell and thought that he was badly done by by the Labor Party, but we won't go into that. Uh, and F.E. Chamberlain, now that's a name we don't okay. mention much. Yeah. F.E. Chamberlain wrote an autobiography. Not many people know about this, and it's, it's a really good book. Interesting, the last chapter's uh, what I would call hymns of praise to Gough Whitlam. He spoke glowingly of Gough Whitlam as the Prime Minister of Australia and after all those fights and Gough went along and, uh, to his final uh, performance in Western Australia and gave a great speech saying what a significant figure he was. I think we've got to remember that in all of this. We can't just describe Gough Whitlam as a, as, as a Liberal progressive. And what these people said about him allows us to sort of work that a little bit. First of all, they did not like him shifting the emphasis of politics from class to human rights and human freedoms. And, that, you know, you can take a human rights and freedom approach and come up with a very strong argument for an industrial relations system that requires regulation and trade. Uh, so none of that means Gough was anti-trade union or anything like that. But nevertheless, the second part of the argument of F.E. Chamberlain in particular was... He did not understand that the parliamentary wing uh, was only part of a broader movement and that broader movement should have equal say and, in fact, should have dominant say uh, 
in the way the politicians work in the parliament. And, and he writes very clearly, the role of a Labor MP is to be a representative of the movement from which they come. And, and Gough, of course, had a slightly different version of that in, in, in the sense that unless it broadened out its views and the way it organised itself, it was going to battle in the electorate. But the third one, and Rodney's mentioned it, and I'm, I'm sure it'll come up in Jenny's talk, they did not like Gough's flirtation with the groupers. And they, they really resented it. And he went into bat for Harradine, as we all know. Uh, he resigned the leadership over it, but won 38-32 against Jim Cairns. Uh, never mentioned Harradine again. Never mentioned him again. And, and, and I think uh, he learned a bit from that. Anyway, Chamberlain argues very strongly that Gough learned a lot from that. Uh, so I think what we've got here is, is from class to human rights and freedoms, uh, a changed organisational structure of the Labor Party, and thirdly, um, you, you know, we've got to watch the DLP people. You know, they'll undermine us as quick as a flash. They certainly stopped Labor getting re-elected in Western Australia in 1959. No question about that. Uh, their preferences went into that. So where do, where does, where do you do, how do you define Gough in all of this? You've got to throw into the argument, I think, and we should talk a bit about this, having spent a year in France on one of their lovely visas, sitting down having a coffee. Freedom equality and fraternity, liberty, equality and fraternity everywhere. Jesus is thinking about it all the time. Thank goodness for the French Revolution reminding us that equality has to be in there. Gough Whitlam was a democratic socialist, as was pointed out. He wasn't, he, he wasn't a liberal progressive. He could have been a Trudeau. He could have been, you know, one of those uh, left, but he wasn't. He believed in the role of the state, either to compete in the economy with the private sector or to deliver redistribution, as was the case with the Medicare and the, and the Carmel uh, principles. Uh, and, and I think in all of the things we say about him being a wonderful liberal, which he was, you only have to read Arthur Corwell's chapter in his biography, uh, Act Just, what is it, I always get it wrong. That's it, thanks John, be just and fear not. There's a chapter on the permissive society. It's pretty hard to absorb now, but that, that all of the views that Arthur Corwell held were anti-human freedom and rights in the way that we now understand uh, that particular uh, term. So really what I'm saying here is I think, yes, in the build-up, wonderful build-up to the election, he, he changed aspects along with others, and we should talk about the others at some point, uh, the Labor order. But he was, to me, very much an orthodox... Labor Party person. Now, what do I mean by that? He believed in equality. He believed in the role of the state. And he didn't back off on any of that. And, and if you look at the electability argument, when it comes up, it's usually, oh, we can't go too far down the equality track because that might, might lose a few votes. So perhaps, you know, the, the point being made uh, about uh, 72 election and the size of the vote, remember... A message a lot of people are hearing about Gough relates to equality and the role of the state, which are clearly not liberal principles. I think that you'd argue in the social democratic, democratic socialist principles. So, a bit of a rambling uh, a commentary, but I, I'd like to hear from the, the panel, you know, on this equality, liberal, lib, liberty thing, and, and I think any assessment of Gough that doesn't have the equality thing right up there, I think will misdescribe what his politics were. I think he was a he was a Labor person in the sense of pursuing equality. Some of the means he pursued to that end were a bit different from the others. And the analogy goes straight to Tony Crossland in the U U UK, straight to... Frank and I share something because we both had a look at his papers in his, his, his wife's house uh, near Oxford there. But Crosland, he, 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 he stuck to equality as a very strong principle. And as time went on, he started to fall out with some of the dominant themes in what was, was becoming a new Labor concept. Frank? Oh, Mr. Um, well, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, and, and absolutely, as you were speaking, I was, I was going to respond by saying, yeah, I mean, Whitlamism is Australian Croslandism, really, um, and it is redistributive and it's about the, an expanding role of the state, not a contracting one. It's about, I mean, fundamentally, too, it, it's a product of um, post-war affluence. I mean, that, that notion of 
of managing abundance, um, governing in, a, in an, a, 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 the affluent society, is at the heart of, of Crosland's The Future of Socialism, the great book he wrote in the 50s. Um, and Whitlam, uh, you know, when asked about this by Andrew Scott, I think, a, a political scientist some years ago, you know, did Crosland exercise any influence of you? Goff's response was bugger all, which is probably true, but they, they um, you know, they, they're essentially, I think, the same sort of project. It's a kind of... It's a revisionist socialism that's losing interest in the usefulness of nationalisation and, and, and you know, that, that particular form of... of, of um, you know, kind of state activity, but um, that doesn't mean that it wants to wind back the state, far from it. It's about expanding welfare provision. Uh, it's about just generally lifting the, 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 the level of state provision, which they imagine could be done in a society that, that was producing these very healthy rates of economic growth during the 1950s and 1960s, and they're extremely healthy. By the time we get to the second half of Australia's 1960s, they're faltering in Britain by that stage. Yeah. So, no, I agree with all that. The other, only other thing I'd add is I think there was a really strong spatial dimension, which, which Graham Freudenberg talks about, actually, in, in you know, his great book on, on Whitlam. Um, that is, the, the notion that, that there should be greater equality um, in terms of provision uh, regardless of where you lived in Australia. Now, that's not a new idea um, in, in even Labor Party circles in the 1960s and 70s, but I think the emphasis that Whitlam gave to that through things like the, you know, the Australian Assistance Plan, for instance, I think is, is, is if not novel, I think kind of distinctive. And, and so if we're thinking about what, what does he bring to the concept of equality, I'd be inclined to, to, to emphasise that as well. I don't know if you... Michelle, yeah, I would just add that I think, yeah. you know, if you look at the ways the, the Whitlam government's policies on for women in particular that were really about expanding that concept of equality. So it was, as you say, it wasn't just about class. It was a, it was a moving to a kind of idea around rights and thinking about the ways that, for example, it was about the recognition of new kinds of rights or new kinds of um, claims from from women in as one group. So childcare, for example, you know Elizabeth's big listening tour of, of Australia was you know women said we want childcare and this was part of that expansion of, of ideas of, of provision of services of welfare, um, recognizing new kinds of claims to rights and equality. So yeah, I think it's precisely what you what you illustrated. You know that there, it is really about kind of in enlarging, you know, um, state provision and enlarging new... ..recognising new kinds of claims um, on the state. Further questions or even comments? Richard? And then Daryl. Thank you. Uh, Richard Whitington. Uh, we, we've touched on the role that Whitlam played in making the party itself more appealing. And I think when you look at the reality that in 72, they did just sort of stagger over the line, that aspect shouldn't be ignored. I was thinking about it, and forgive me, I, I wrote it down as I was coming in this morning on the train, actually. In, in 1965, he, Whitlam observed of Labor's national conference that of the 36 delegates, 15 were employed by unions, five by the party, and 15 were members of parliament, either state, federal or local, and one of the 36 was self-employed. The other 35, as he put it, was sustained by the labour movement. When he formed his ministry in 1972 of 27 people, none of them women, 19 of them had never been employed by a trade union or the party. 19 out of 27 had never been employed by a trade union or the party. That's a stat that I suspect um, stacks up better than perhaps the current ministry and, and many that have preceded it under Labor governments. And I think you look at the nature of some of the candidates that Whitlam persuaded to stand for the Labor Party did a, a, a huge amount in broadening its appeal. It's the, the stat I wanted to quote you. Yeah. Well, you got one. Um, Henry Vickers. I just wanted but to ask... Can oh, we just sorry. see if um, Frank or Michelle want to comment on that? Or just uh, no, I'm happy yeah. to take it as a comment. Really interesting stat. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. Okay. And then now... And then, and then Daryl. 
<laughs> sorry, thanks. Sorry for jumping the line there, and sorry, Daryl, I'm taking the mic here. Henry Vickers. <laughs> I just um, had a question, given we're talking about February 1967 in this slice of history and what Australia looks like at this stage, um, and we were talking a little bit about the groupers and the DLP. What is the sort of Australian relationship to religion at this this point in time? What is what? How is that changing in the Australian consciousness? And given you know Labor's coming out of this period of pretty significant sort of role of sectarianism in the in Labor politics, how is their relation to that relationship to that changing in in the sixty seven? Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, we deal with it briefly in the in the essay, um, only briefly. Uh, well, look, anyone who, who knows about Australia in the 50s, the Labor split, its legacies knows just how um, how seriously sectarian divisions, denominational differences were taken. Um, <laughs> I remember a piece by Rodney, actually, on, on uh, the split in some of the, the, the branches here in Sydney. What, what, what was this at a branch meeting? I will not abandon faith in my maker, or something. One of the one of the disaffected during one of these these brawls said, "You know, at a Labor Party branch meeting, um, it, it, it remains important." I mean, clearly, um, the, the the obvious shift towards state aid um, with the the, the uh, you know the, the Menzies undertaking at the nineteen sixty three election around science blocks. Um, the uh, shift of the Labor Party in that direction probably takes some of the heat out of the political dimensions of those differences. But look, the, the, the Melbourne in which I grew up in as a Catholic in the 1970s, these differences still mattered um, even then. Uh, the Labor Party in Victoria in the 1980s still looked, had, had a slight vaguely anti-Catholic uh, aspect to it. I mean, the, the, the victory of... Um, uh, of um, Pauline Toner in, I think, the 19, uh, 1977, maybe, uh, by-election in Greensboro was regarded as a breakthrough. I mean, Toners were friends of our family in Melbourne and a breakthrough because he was a, a Catholic, Catholic woman in this case, uh, uh, being, uh, you know, pre-selected for a winnable seat, you know, and that, that gives you, I mean, this is still re regarded as notable today, I think gives you a sense of just how important those those legacies remained. And, of course, it's one of the critical points that leads up to the intervention, the federal intervention in the Victorian branch and the New South Wales branch, but primarily the Victorian branch in 1971, was a, a dreadful brawl over state aid during the 1970 Victorian election where basically, you know, the party policy by that stage is to support a needs-based education system and, of course, the Victorian central executive contradicts um, Clyde Holding during the campaign to his great, you know, the great embarrassment of the of the party. Um, so, you know, even at that late stage, these things really still still mattered. Yeah. Michelle, do you want to? Yeah, look, I was just going to, in, in terms of the social. Whoops. In terms of the social history, I mean, my parents got married in the late 60s and that was still described as a mixed marriage, like Catholic, Protestant. So there's still that social understanding. But, of course, the fact that there are more mixed marriages happening means that that, you know, that idea is breaking down. And I think Frank mentions in the essay that, um, as I said, the popularity of the contraceptive pill in Australia, a number of those women taking the pill would have been Catholic. So I think you're also seeing a sort of secularising trend that's happening you know, worldwide in that, you know, at least in the Western world in that period too. So it's, yeah, twin forces. Can I, can I just add that when we were doing our book and we were talking to people about their childhoods and backgrounds, the Catholic-Protestant divide came up every time. And in actual fact, I've often said this, but it's true, I came from Beecroft and I did not talk to a Catholic till I got to university and I was 18. I had never talked to a Catholic. We keep forgetting that. Okay, Daryl Mellon. Thanks, Meredith. I just want to raise one area of Goff's influence um, that I think is important to acknowledge. Um, I had a relationship with Goff as a Member of Parliament and so did a number of other members. And Goff used us as Members of Parliament to pursue his passion for the signing up to inter in international instruments. And I remember having a discussion with Michael Duffy, the Attorney General. He was lobbied when he was Attorney General by Gough. And if one does the research, one will see that there are a number of instruments signed up 
by the Hawke government and with when Mike, Michael Duffy was Attorney General and it was directly as a result of Gough's lobbying. Most members of parliament didn't have a bloody clue what it meant to sign up to, to an international instrument. Gough did. He understood the powers and the benefits that it would uh, deliver to uh, Australians if, if we sign up. And he did it when he wasn't in parliament. He did it um, in a way that he just never let it go and he got a lot through. So when it says Daryl Mellum asked questions on this or Robert McClelland asked questions on this or Colin Hollis, we were the three main ones, it was really Gough Whitlam <laughs> giving us credibility <laughs> for, the, <laughs> for the issue. But it was also impactful. Like even the Libs didn't understand at, at so, sometimes what they were bloody signing. Goff, Goff did. He was ahead of the action. The fact that he did it when he was well and truly out of Parliament showed his passion was for a better society for all of us and he never stopped and that's why many of us idolise him, me being included in that. Thanks, Daryl. And I, I was not aware of that but it's absolutely exactly what Goff would have been doing. And as we all know, you could not say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, the only comment, um, thank you, it's a really important points. Um, uh, the, the other observation I'd make is that, you know, I think um, it's also a part of a larger, I guess, um, trend, for want of a better word, in, in the 60s, of which, um, which Whitlam epitomises, and that is that the best – Australia should pursue the best international standards. That's the nature of his nationalism. It's not parochial. It's – there are – the best international standards are, are out there. Sometimes we'll find them here in Australia, but not always. We'll also find them in Canada. We'll find them in New Zealand. We'll find them in the United States. Um, and, and we should research that and adapt it and use it. And I think that particular ethic, it's not, I mean, it's very distinctive to Whitlam, but we also find it, it's almost in the nature of Australian cosmopolitanism. People like Robin Boyd thought exactly the same thing. And so I, I, it's not just Whitlamism, but certainly he gave it a, a very powerful turn in, in relation to international covenants and agreements. Yeah. Barry Arnsworth. I'd just like to say this, Gough Whitlam in 1967 changed the face of the Labor Party. I joined the party in 55, campaigned for Doc Evatt in 55, 58, were up against Menzies, disastrous results. And then Arthur Caldwell took over. Now, quite frankly, as the face of the Labor Party, Arthur wasn't very pretty. <laughs> So that after we went through those years and the, the early Vietnam period, it was a great change when Gough took over. And if you were involved in the campaigns in 69 and 72, the Labor Party was getting a lot better. The Labor Party was getting more attractive than it had been previously. I heard some commentary here today in support of Arthur Caldwell. My first experience with Arthur Call was in the 1961 election. I went to his office in Martin Place because I had uh, Senator McKenna's bag in my car and I had to return it to him. And Gough was Caldwell's deputy and I was taken up to meet the four leaders. And Caldwell took me into his office, private his office, and, he, and I thought, what is he going to do? He brought a very small transistor radio out and he said, Barry, can you fix it? <laughs> because he was, he, was, he was travelling off to New Guinea and my advice to him was buy a new one at customs <laughs> at the airport. <laughs> yes. Well, Barry, th th Barry there you. are precedents for this because, you know, it also needs to be recalled that... I think Chifley sought the expert advice of Jack Beasley in London on getting a nice new electric razor too. So, you know, 
Very good. <laughs> I know, exactly the same story though, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Barry, for that. Um, further questions or comments? Th no. Thanks, Meredith. My question is to see. Michelle. I was very interested in your remarks about the working class and their vote for the Liberals during the 50s and 60s. Just wonder if you could expand on that and whether that there was a transition there when Gough came to power. Mm. What was the level of support amongst the working class at the time? That I don't... Have I remember just that was some figures that I, I pulled out because I was kind of thinking about the middle, you know, the white collar vote for Labor rather than the other way. So I'm sorry I can't shed any more light on that particular moment. But Frank may have some more I, to say I don't about know. that. I'm sure that there are people in the room that have you know yeah. would, would know about this, like Murray. Um, I mean, what what we do know, I think, is the point you made, Michelle, that those constituencies that we often think of as critical to, you know, the rise of Whitlam and the coming of the Labor government in 72, and one thinks here of young, younger people, one thinks here of women, um, uh, that, um, you know, the, the, the best research we have suggests that, you know, there was no great propensity towards Labor voting through the 60s. Murray recently pointed out to me some research on, on this and there's a, a gender gap, isn't there, in the, in the I think, the first half of the 1960s where women are more likely to vote for the coalition in federal elections. Um, it, it bobs around over the decades, but that's certainly the phase you're in in the 1960s. And that's my recollection of the kinds of points made by people like Don Aitken in their sort of studies in the, when they came out in the 70s. So... That, that seems rather important. I think the winning over of, of, of those constituencies is clearly a critical part of this process, as you pointed out, Michelle. Time for one more question. I think we've got Liz, Elizabeth. Oh, oh, Liz, Liz Reid. And then maybe a follow-up from Murray if he wants to. I just wanted to question um, that... I feel that there was a wooing and, and these groups started looking more towards ALP, but I think there was a very real backlash amongst the men of the ALP when that happened. Mm -hmm. And we should mention both together. Yeah. Are you saying that when it was clear that women were voting for the Labor Party, the men in the Labor Party objected? Yes. yes. Well, they still are. <laughs> it's, it's still an ongoing battle, Liz, I can mm. assure you. Mm. Come in women, come in young people. But you had both uh, that belief that women voted as their husbands told them to was deeply ingrained. You had a belief in women's place, being in the home, certainly not in the political arena and not in, po in the fight of politics. And, and you just had that gut visceral reaction to women being there. Now, all that may still be the case, but it's at least is saying what we're up against and not just saying he wooed Whitlam and they came running. Mm. And it's important too, I think, um, sorry. It's important too when we look at things like the 1973 debate about abortion decriminalisation in the ACT, that that divided the Labor Party as much as it, you know, exactly. divided the Parliament because there were a number of Labor MPs who were never going to vote Thanks for that. So... I think that it's really important to remember that this is, you know, the women's electoral lobby, I think, were important because they forced the issue onto the agenda and then Labor responds. But it is, you know, there's a, an interplay there, I think, and a lot of hostility that we see. Yes. And can I just add that I think the 1994 debate about quotas uh, for women um, standing for Parliament that we had in the Labor Party and the women won at that conference in 1994, it's really interesting to see the Libs playing that out now, 25 years later. And I keep saying to Liberal women, you've got to get it sorted because it took us 25 years to get to 50% after we'd brought in the rule and the Libs are only talking about it now. So, yes, the, the history of the battle, as it might be called. Ongoing yes, ongoing struggle. And... Murray, your right of reply. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not a right of reply. I just want to add a footnote to Jeff Gallup's remarks about Goff and the DLP. Late in the 60s, someone close to Whitlam uh, put Roy Morgan up to asking in the Gallup poll 
How would people vote if Labor split Whitlam joining the DLP and Cairns uh, taking the rest of the Labor Party? Uh, and the vote was heavily in favour of Whitlam and the DLP over Cairns and I suspect over the Liberals as well. I, I mean, it's one of the most, more interesting Gallup polls. It didn't come out of... <laughs> It, it, didn't, it didn't come out of uh, Roy Morgan's imagination. It was put up to it by someone who I know very close to Whitlam. <laughs> OK, now, is that a question or a five, five minutes to the end? Thank you. Does yeah. anyone want to comment on that extraordinary uh, insight into the way polling <laughs> it's not, happens in It's Australia? sort of the same category if Goff had wheels, you know. Would you ride him as a bus to Canberra or something? You know, it's, <laughs> OK, perhaps one more and then we'll stop for um, morning tea so that these discussions can continue. I must say I've learned a huge amount. Um, well, if, if there's no new person, Rodney, the, your final co comment. Following up on Murray and uh, Jeff Gallup, if we were at a meeting of the left in 1967, 68, really all the way through till 69, we'd be describing Goff as a class collaborating, backsliding meritocrat. We shouldn't forget that was an overwhelming view of a lot of people. The importance of the Haradine affair is that Goff supported a very unimpressive person who was an NCC operative. The importance of it is that Goff looked into the abyss. Did he really want to be associated with those people? And he didn't. And that is why for the rest of Goff's life, B.A. Santa Maria would refer back to the Haradine affair and note that Goff retreated because he didn't dare break the grip of the pro-communist left. It's a central point, but we shouldn't forget, we should not eliminate what was the thinking of a lot of people, perhaps the majority of the branch membership, as late as 1969. Thank you, Frank. Do you want to comment? Uh, no. no, not really. I mean, it is obviously worth keeping in mind that the you know, the, the idea of a reconciliation with the DLP sits there, doesn't it, right through the, the 60s. And, um, you know, Pat Keneally was talking to them, wasn't he, at different points. So, you know, it, it's easy now in retrospect, I suppose, to say this is utterly impossible, couldn't have happened, whatever, but, you know, um, it, it is on the agenda as, as, a, as a, a, a possibility during the period. The only other thing I'd add, I was recently, I had occasion to, I was asked to do something on, the Kane government, and and I look, you know, I was just looking at, at John Kane's involvement in the Victorian Labor Party in the 1960s. John Kane Jr., of course, and I went back to some you know, notes I had on the Victorian Central Executive Minutes. They are obsessed with the DLP. One of their, you know, leading figures is retiring from the executive. I think in 1969, and he gives a farewell, you know, uh, speech to his his comrades, and he says, you know, and keep fighting. Keep fighting, not the Liberals. It's a DLP. That's all he mentions. There's no mention of the Liberal Party whatsoever in, 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 in the minutes. It's keep fighting the DLP. They're the enemy. Yeah. Michelle, do you want to comment? No, okay, well, I'd like to finish up this, this very entertaining session where we've all learnt stuff that we didn't know and I'd like to thank Frank Bongiorno and Emma Cubitt, the... Uh, the writers of the paper, and Michelle Arrow for your wonderful response. Thank you very much. <laughs>